The law school is located downtown um, and we're essentially one city block. So it's a nice feel to the campus. It's you know substantial. You can kind of see from this picture, but it's also very, um, you know, it's not huge uh, and you're separated from the rest of the campus. So you know that everyone or the rest of the LMU school so it's nice that you know that everyone you're walking around, everyone who's in the library, everyone who's in the um, the cafeteria and their classes, they're all law school students, whether they're in the JD program, the LLM program, uh, the MLS program. Um, by the way, if you are interested in either the LLM program or the MLS program, we have a breakout room for those students. So just um, raise your hand and I'll, I'll move you into that breakout room. Um, but I work for admissions, uh, in the JD area. So that's the Juris Doctorate. Um, and anyway, the law school, uh, was founded a little over a hundred years ago. Uh, we have always been very committed to social justice. Uh, we started as an evening school, an evening program school, um, because we've, we've always found it very important to make sure that we are providing that access and getting um, folks who otherwise couldn't attend, you know, a full-time program, those access to a legal education uh, through the part-time program. Um, uh, and then of course, being a Jesuit Institute, as I'm sure you're familiar with, um, we, uh, again, the commitment to social justice is there. Uh, and our commitment to a diverse campus community. Uh, we don't have religious course requirements at the law school. Um, we do have a chapel on campus though, and we have student groups of all sorts of um, religious backgrounds, um, ethnic backgrounds, and just interests. So um, it's definitely a very diverse, vibrant campus. Um, and yes, experience, experience, experience is really what we're known for. So um, we have a pro bono requirement, which I'm gonna get into a little bit later, but um, that's where a lot of students do the hands-on learning with um, our clinics. We have over 20 clinics and I'm gonna get into all of that later, but we have a lot of experiential learning uh, in our curriculum. And then, like I mentioned before, we have the JD program, um, and then the MLS and LLM are two programs that are not the JD. So the MLS is a two, or sorry, is a um, is a one year program, and then the LLM is for those who are attorneys internationally um, and then want to practice in the states. Uh, and then there are some people who are domestic and who want to do an LLM program to just further their education. So again, if you are part of, if you are interested in that, then there's a breakout room and I can um, put you over there. Um, for the JD program, uh, our JD program is about 270-ish students each year. So last year is 274. Um, our evening program is a hybrid part-time program. So it's a four-year program. Um, and that was about 48 students. It's typically around 45 to 50. Um, with the hybrid program, it's one evening a week on campus and one evening a week remote, uh, whereas the day program is five days a week, um, you know, a more traditional eight to three or 10 to five, depending on your on your program um, or your section. Um, so that's kind of what the, the main JD programs look like. And then we also have the joint JD MBA program and then a joint JD tax LLM. So like I said, it, the tax or the LLM is not just for international students. So that way you're getting a JD, the typical Juris Doctorate, but then you're also adding on this second degree, the tax LLM uh, to your degree. And then the JD MBA, similar, you're doing, you're getting your JD and you're getting your MBA at LMU. Um, so the MBA, I can ask, or I'll have um, plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you are interested in those, I can kind of do a deeper dive. The MBA is um, your second year. Um, so your first year, you start at the JD program, then you'll apply to be in the joint program. And the MBA is all done at LMU's campus. And then the JD portion is all done at our campus. Um, and so it's a four-year program. So you have to be in the full-time day JD in order to do the four-year JD MBA, if that makes sense. 
Uh, the JD tax LLM can be done in three years um, if you're doing the full-time JD program. Um, I feel like I just said it with so many numbers. So hopefully, again, I can answer questions at the end. Um, so hopefully this is all making sense so far. Uh, academics wise, so we have concentrations in law, most law schools as opposed to majors, like you're familiar with an undergrad. Um, we have 11 concentrations. They do act similarly to a major in that they streamline your education. They get you focused on something specific, um, but they're not as rigid, I would say, as a major. It doesn't feel like once you start in one, you have to stay there. I, I remember, at least for me in my undergrad, it was very difficult to switch your major um, and to switch into a different college and all those things. It was very difficult. So it's it's not like that. They are more functioning as elective courses. So you can theoretically graduate without a concentration. It can just be um, a JD. Everyone graduates with a JD and you can just take whatever electives interest you. Um, but of course it is nice to kind of get involved with, you know, make your network and the professors and to, to streamline it a little bit. Um, but then we have four courses of study. So those are popular courses of, or tracks, uh, typically for students, family law, healthcare law, environmental law, and law and the political process. So those we don't have a full concentration for, we just have like a mini concentration basically. So we don't have enough courses to make it an entire concentration, but you can fill them in, you can do public interest and then do family law on top of it. So those are basically additional courses. And then three law reviews, those are essentially um, uh, journals and uh, those are essential, essentially research journals. Um, so it's the Loyola LA Journal, the Entertainment Journal, International and Comparative Law Review. And um, then there's 14 competition teams. So that can be Moot Court, Burn Trial Team, um, Transactional Negotiation Team, all of those, um, or there's so many more, there's 14 plus probably at this point. Um, and all these things are things that you would start after your first year. So the first year of law school is really nice in that you get to kind of settle in and take your required courses, um, and there's so many events happening on campus that you really get to know what's going on and what opportunities, especially the experiential opportunities are available. Um, we put on twice a year, the experiential learning fair, and that's when all the clinics come out and, um, a bunch of other just things that you can get involved with practicum, everything, get out there and, um, you can learn more about all the things that you can do at, in law school. So I know, you know, can't speak for everyone, but it, it typically students coming in are really stressed about, you know, maybe they don't know exactly what they want to concentrate in or what they're going to do. And you have time to, um, to figure that out. So like I keep mentioning over and over again, experiential learning, um, we have a 40 hour pro bono requirement um, in order to graduate. And we have over 20 clinics and those are all housed on campus. So the clinics are where you're doing the real hands-on work. You're working on real cases with real lawyers. Um, some really popular ones are Project for the Innocent, um, the uh, juvenile, juvenile Justice Clinic, I believe. I always get confused between the concentration, the clinic. Um, there's a tax clinic. There's so many clinics. Um, so you can really find something that you're interested in um, through those clinics. Uh, and then practica and field placements are similar to internships. Um, those are typically, you know, offered through, you know, public interest organizations, government offices, um, private firms, all sorts of things. Um, those are more of like your internships that you would do maybe in undergrad. Student life. Let's see if I can play this video sometimes. It works. So we do have an orchestra on our campus. Um, I'm not sure if you as LMU students have heard of the orchestra. I assume you have your own orchestra, uh, but this is the law school's orchestra. So if you are a musician, um, you can get involved. And I always like to play a little bit of it because I just think it's so good. So this is Professor uh, Simona Grossi. She is a professor here um, and she is 
um, also a conductor. So she leads the orchestra. You know what I just realized? Oop. Anyway, I just realized that I probably didn't share my sound, but that is the student, or that is the uh, the student-led orchestra. And that was our main quad area that they, they perform in uh, every year. So something to get involved with. But like I said before, we have a bunch of student orgs um, ranging from just interests. Maybe you're really interested in a real estate law. There's a group for that or just a religious background, a identity background, anything like that. There is most likely a student org for it. And if there isn't, you are uh, welcome to make one. But we have a lot. And then the application journey. So, so many questions, very stressful. Again, I will answer questions at the end. Um, it does not need to be stressful. It can be pretty straightforward. And you guys hopefully are all um, ahead of the game. And that's really the best thing to do is just to, to be ahead um, time-wise. So the application, I always have to say this first because um, I never know where everyone is in the process. Um, but, uh, LSAC is where you would go to submit your application. LSAC is also who administers the LSAT, which is the exam. Um, so LSAC.org is a super helpful, um, super helpful website, uh, if you are not already familiar. So I highly recommend going, um, there, uh, the CAS report is something that LSAC compiles for us. So it includes your LSAT scores your transcripts and your letters of recommendation. So um, GRE not included in the CAS report. If you do decide to apply with a GRE, we accept either the LSAT or the GRE. Um, you would have to submit those through ETS and that's just a different um, process, but you would still have to fulfill a CAS report. Um, then the application packet has your personal statement, your resume or any addenda. Um, and then um, optional statements. These are new. So this year we added two optional statements, identity and background, and then interest in Loyola Law School. Uh, and I'm gonna get into all of these as we go. But those are the main things. So your transcripts, um, LSAC does make a cumulative GPA for you based on all of your undergrad experience. So that includes your time at, um, at uh, a community college or just your any other undergrads that you went to. Uh, and then, so just keep that in mind. You might be thinking, oh, I'm applying with a 3.9 and then you look, you forget that you took community college credits or what have you. So just keep that in mind that it might shake out a little differently with the um, CAS report. But it's always good to know that the admissions committee looks at everything. So you'll look at your transcripts um, and see grade trends. So if you um, had a rough freshman year, but then it really went up. I mean, we see that a lot with COVID. Um, some students not doing as well during those years and then having a big increase um, towards the end. So that's a positive, of course, for us. Um, whereas the opposite would maybe be a slight negative if you start out really strong your freshman and sophomore year and then it declined, that might be seen you know, not so great to the admissions committee. Um, and we're gonna get into addenda, but that is when you would maybe want to include a GPA addendum. Maybe something happened um, and you want to disclose that to the admissions committee and that's why your grades took a little dip. Um, graduate transcripts are accepted. So if you went to graduate school, um, you don't have to submit your transcripts, but of course it's encouraged. Um, graduate school will look good that you continued your education. Um, then we have the EAP. It's a pretty standard application, asks you very basic you know, questions, but then the more important ones, your program. So like I was saying before, we have a day program and evening program. You can also apply to both. So if you choose 
um, to apply to both, you would just have to put, um, you'd have to indicate which one is your preference. You will only get into one, so you won't get into both and be able to choose. You would only get admitted to one program. If you're a reapplicant, um, again, happy to go into more detail with reapplicants later, but um, if you are a reapplicant, you would just want to make sure that you're putting in um, updated materials, that you've really taken the time to assess why you were denied or waitlisted the year before or whenever um, that decision happened, and then make those really strong updates to your application. Early decision um, is the one that is binding. So if you decide to apply early decision, um, that would be in the fall. So our application typically opens in September um, and early decisions usually do December 1st. So if you're admitted through early decision, that means that it's binding and you would have to withdraw all of your other um, applications to other schools. Um, and then we have character and fitness. Um, so if you had any convictions as a felony, misdemeanor, anything like that, um, and this is all outlined on our application instructions, uh, you would just have to include an addendum just stating the circumstances, just giving background information to the admissions committee. Personal statement, um, the do's and the don'ts. Um, so with a personal statement, I always tell applicants to think about how they don't have the opportunity to interview. So all the admissions committee is seeing are, um, are the, the numbers that are in your application. They're seeing just a lot of written material, but they can't see, get to know who you are, um, except for really through the personal statement. So that's really where you want to tell the admissions committee how well-rounded you are what you're going to bring to our community and our campus. Um, and we don't expect you to already sound like lawyers and to just rattle off, you know, all the ways that you already know how the legal world works. Um, we don't expect you to really know too much about it yet. That's why you're going to school. So, um, so do tell your voice, tell your story in your own voice, be authentic. Um, check your grammar because that is the other thing that we're looking for with a personal statement. It's not just um, um, it's not just what you are giving to us to read. It's it's um, or your story. It's also how well you are or how good you are at writing um, and how concise you can um, tell your story. Those are all important things that we're looking for too. Um, don't pay attention to Reddit. I think it can be helpful a little bit. Um, you know, it can gauge some things. I, of course, look at Reddit for certain things, but I think in the law school application world, it only really makes you anxious. So um, this is more of a broad recommendation, but I always recommend to call the admissions office of any school that you're applying to before you go to Reddit. Um, most admissions offices are very nice and are willing to answer any of your questions. So I would go there first and then take Reddit with a grain of salt. Um, also don't restate your resume or complain or offer too many excuses. Um, remember, this is like the one thing you're giving us. So we already see your resume. You don't need to restate it. Um, and the addenda can be where you maybe don't complain or offer too many excuses, but you give some background to anything that you want to, your GPA, your LSAT, um, which I'm going to get into in a few moments. Um, so like I said, we just, uh, we just added um, optional statements to the application. So we have a background and identity statement, and then we have an LLS interest statement. Um, these are one to two pages, double space, 12 point font. Um, I didn't mention this with a personal statement, but same thing, double space, 12 point font. That can be more like three pages, um, two to three pages, I would say. Um, and the background and identity statement is really anything that will, any uh, story, any information that you want to tell the admissions committee that will show what you'll bring to our campus, how you will, um, what unique experiences you'll bring there, um, and just how your life experience has shaped who you are and 
um, your goals and your identity. And then the LLS interest statement is, um, you know, any concentration that you're interested in, uh, any clinic, anything that you're interested in with Loyola Law School, you're welcome to write a statement about it. And if you have certain goals that you want to achieve, all those things can be in the LLS interest statement. So we do accept uh, two letters of recommendation. Only one is required. Academic or professional letters are preferred. And I would say like strongly preferred. Um, we don't want friends or your mentors can get finicky. Like diff I wouldn't really go for a mentor unless maybe you've worked with them. Um, and academic is always good if you are within five years of uh, having graduated. So if your faculty relationships are recent, then I would really utilize them. Uh, but professional is fine too. Resume is optional, highly recommended, one to two pages in length, standard resume format, and then addenda, like I keep mentioning, optional. Um, I would make the addenda brief. So if you want to provide a GPA addendum or an LSAT addendum because you scored lower than you, felt like you could, something happened, you want to give context to your junior year of college, there's something, you know, one to two paragraphs is fine. Um, and uh, you're just providing context to the admissions committee. And then um, resume, it's a pretty standard, you know, same as you would see for a professional resume. Um, I think you can be a little more interesting in this, in a law school resume. Um, I've seen people put that they've, you know, hiked to the Himalayas and things like that, that I think are impressive. So you can put things like that, that maybe you wouldn't typically put in a, um, in a work resume. Okay. That's it. I don't know if I just blew through that so fast. I don't think I did. I feel like it took a long time, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions. This is my, um, personal email and my phone number. So feel free to jot those down and I'm going to close my screen in a moment and I'm happy to answer any questions. And then I do have some student ambassadors with me too. Um, hello, Carrie, or wait, I'm sorry. It's, isn't it Kari? Yeah. Yep, it's Kari. Right, Kari. Okay, yes, Hello. Kari. <laughs> I'm Kari. I'm a 2E evening student. And then Mary and Lauren, feel free to introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Mary. I'm a 3L day student here. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm a 1L student. Perfect. And I just want to say real quick, if anyone is interested in the LLM program or MLS program, just let me know in the chat box and I'll put you into the breakout room. Um, with our counselor who does LLM and MLS program. And any way, um, any questions for me as the working in admissions or for any of our student ambassadors, don't be afraid. Has anyone applied to Loyola yet? I have a question. Sure. Um. So I was wondering about the dual program for law school and the master's program as well. I know I saw on the website that there are a lot of different uh, JD programs that are um, considered that are connected with master programs. But I wanted to know specifically: do um, does LMU offer any dual programs that have a master's degree in mathematics as well as law school? No. So the only dual programs we have are the JD Tax LLM and then the JD MBA. Um, those are the only joint programs that we have right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, I saw someone asked about the clinic. So with pretty much most experiential opportunities, they're all things that you would start your second year. If no one has questions, I'm going to ask Sorry to say what your favorite thing is about Loyola. I have a lot of favorites. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really like that Loyola is very community minded. I feel like at least in my cohort, so I'm in the evening program and I'm in my second year and everyone in my group is just 
we're very supportive of each other and we have large study groups and we try to be as inclusive as possible and just encourage each other's wins and help each other when they're struggling and that to me and the teachers have a similar philosophy of helping students to get better and encouraging people and helping us to get through the program successfully. So I appreciate the positivity that the school has. Nice. Mary, do you want to share what your favorite thing is about Loyola? Sure. I would echo the fact that there's a lot of great people here from your classmates to the professors. Professors are typically very accessible. Um, like I've had multiple professors give their personal cell phone numbers if you have questions. And so I've always felt like if I ever need something, um, I could reach out, at, you know, within a reasonable time frame with re regards to deadlines and exams and everything. And I think it's a really great school that will prepare you both for the bar exam and for practice. There's a lot of skills-based classes that you can get into uh, as a 2L and 3L because things are pretty much set when you're a 1L for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ashley asked in the chat, um, is it possible to do a part-time JD MBA program if we want to work full-time throughout? Uh, the answer is unfortunately no. Uh, you do have to be in the full-time JD program in order to do the joint program. Um, you do have to sit for the bar. Um, you have to finish your law degree within five years. So it would take too long to do the evening JD and the MBA as well. So you do have to be in the full-time program. Lauren, I was going to ask you how it feels your first year. How is it different from what you expected? Is it the same? Did you think it was similar to college? How is it going? Um, I feel a lot more supported than I did in college. I really like the fact that we get assigned a counselor and that counselor stays with you throughout your time at law school. And I really like the writing specialist we get access to because throughout my graded one and graded two briefs, that was really helpful. Like aside from office hours, going to those writing specialists and having those appointments was really, it would really help my transition because writing a brief and a memo is completely new to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Um... Does anyone have any questions? Sophia. Yes. Um, I have several. Um, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all, I have like a more technical question because I'm only a sophomore in college right now. So mm -hmm. what exactly is the difference between a GRE and an LSAT? Like how would you decide which one you would take? Sure. Has anyone taken both? Any of the, I can talk about them in a more broad. So the GRE is a grad graduate exam that's accepted for a, a lot of different graduate programs. Um, and whereas the LSAT was designed by LSAC, the Law School Admission Council, for students who are specifically applying to law school. Um, so they're different in what they test. And you can look up um, some practice questions to sort of get the hang of it or to see the differences. Um, I would recommend doing that and then looking to see what you think you would do better in. Um, the only thing is with the GRE, not every law school accepts the GRE. So you would have to also see what schools are accepting the GRE because um, you most likely would not want to do both uh, since they cost money and you're studying for one exam. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just wanted to ask... Uh... Uh, the students here, like, what was it like to um, apply to law school and what made you uh, pick Loyola, like, for anyone who wants to answer? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so what was it like to apply to law school? It was exciting and a little scary. <laughs> I'd say probably a little bit of both because it's, you're wondering, is it going to be a good fit for you? Is the school going to be a good, are you a good fit for them? So there's a little bit of that kind of, okay, what's this going to be like? Where am I going to end up going? And for me, I live in South Orange County. So to reach further out to places like Loyola Law School was a little bit like, I don't know, it's a bit of a distance. But so I, I would say exciting and both a little bit daunting was the experience. And then uh, what was your second question? I'm sorry. 
Uh, no worries. Just um, why did you pick Loyola Marymount? Ah, yes. Okay. So I picked Loyola because... For me, it has a religious base. It's You can be whatever religion you want here. They're welcoming to all faiths. Uh, but I really liked that about it. And then I really liked how competitive it was in the rankings and how people have a good, it has a good representation, uh, a good, it, it's well represented within the community. If you talk to people who have gone to law school, if you talk to lawyers, if you talk to judges, people tend to know Loyola Law School. So it's good because you immediately have an in where people have a familiarity. So I liked that about it. And the feedback is also very positive. So whenever I talk to someone, not only do they recognize the university, they also have an affinity to it where they say that they're really good law students and that they come out practice ready. All the things that you would really want upon graduation, those, it checked all the boxes for me. So. I I really enjoy it. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> no, it definitely does. Thank you so much. Yeah. And just one last question. Um, because I've kind of like, um, in terms of like, you know, if you want to to like, you know, because you know, like every like financial situations are different for everybody. But if you were to, you know, like want to like work or something of the sort, how would that how would that be like the work balance situation? How like you know, I'm just curious about that. So you can I go think ahead. We, okay, I was I, I think we all kind of have different experiences here. <laughs> uh, so I'm in the evening program and I'd say 90% of my class works full time. Um, so that's considering it's a group of about 55 people, that's a significant group. Uh, I personally don't. I, I have two kids and I had been working like 80 plus hour weeks and it would be just too much to do law school on top of having my children and commuting and all that. Um, but the majority of my cohort uh, does a full-time job and they attend classes. And it seems to work really well. It's about 20 hours worth of study per week. And then we have classes on Monday evenings. And then we have, those are in person. And then we have classes on Wednesday. Those are remote. Those are virtual. And they're in the evenings. So you would be able to do a full-time job. And then you'd be able to do the evening program if you wanted to. It gives you a lot of flexibility to be able to do both and to be able to get a good income at the same time. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. For day students, it's a little harder to, to work. Um, but typically, we also recommend not working. Um, I think more than like 10 hours a week. Um, if you are really needing to work. Um, so I don't know, Mary, or I mean, Mary, you might be doing more externship type things. I don't know, but yeah. Um, I've never worked during the school year um, and I haven't done an externship during the school year either, but I know a lot of people have, but um, typically those are unpaid and for credits instead um, of payments. So that's a different kind of setup. But over the summer, after your 1L and, and 2L years, there are opportunities for paid jobs, um, just depending on what you want to do. And then, Kari, you have a question in the chat from Claire. I'm interested in the JD evening program. Could you talk about your experience with your first year in the program regarding curriculum, how many courses you take per semester, how you fit in the pro bono work? With working full time, which you kind of touched on some of those things. Yeah, so I I just responded within the chat. Oh, oh. so we we usually take about three classes per semester. We sometimes take four, and then within the class structure, there's usually one of those three is the more difficult one, where it takes like maybe ten hours a week of your time to be able to study for it. <laughs> And then we have usually kind of a middle level class where it's a little bit easier. And then we have one where it's a little bit easier still. So they do a really good job of balancing the coursework. So that way you get kind of the best of all worlds. You're still chugging along, but at the same time, it's still very manageable. Uh, so I think that that answers your question there. For pro bono work, I am just going to be doing an internship maybe coming up this summer. So I haven't personally done my pro bono work yet. I am only a 2E, so I still have some time. But I've 
I, some of my classmates are already doing some and I have a research assistant position that I'm doing here at the school. So that takes additional time and it fits in nicely because as I mentioned earlier, uh, when Sophia was asking some questions, when we have classes, we're only in the evenings on Mondays and then we're virtual on Wednesdays. So it's really flexible for being able to put pro bono in there as well. I can, awesome. I can add one more thing yeah. about jobs during school. Um, there are also work study opportunities on campus. Like I have a part-time job at the library front desk um, and that's capped at a certain number of hours per semester, but that's also something that you can consider. Mm -hmm. I think also you can't do work study until after your 1L. Yes, I think. Um, any other questions, either application wise or for our students? Is everyone a hundred percent wanting to apply to law school or is everyone not going to apply to law school now that they've come to this presentation? Okay. I will just keep asking our ambassadors questions. Um, do what has been your favorite class and Lauren I will go with you first since you are in your first year what has been uh, your favorite class um I think my favorite class would have to be legal research and that's because they don't cold call and it was very flexible and <laughs> how to research like scholarly articles and like read how, how to read the briefs like Westlaw and Lexis that was really helpful for me and I think that helped me read cases from my other classes as well because in the beginning I had a hard time like figuring out the structure of how the book was organized and how like the what the courts held and what the issue was but it helped me spot issues a lot better. Mary? Do you have a favorite class? Um, I'd have to say maybe criminal procedure that for basically what that means is in a very general sense, like things that uh, police are allowed to do and that's within their constitutional reach when they interact with, um, you know, people and things that raise their suspicion. And I thought that was just something really good to know um, as just a person that exists in daily society and like what, you know, what pol authority police actually have. Uh, and it's also a bar course. So quite helpful in terms of things that you have to know in order to get your license. <laughs> nice. Kari? I think my favorite was constitutional law. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually I've really enjoyed all of them it's actually hard for me to pick some of them are like hard like I look back on it and I'm like ah! but fondly on all of them in hindsight still but constitutional law I feel like kind of to what Mary was saying there's a lot of applicability to day-to-day -day life where what rights and liberties do we have and what's happening in the Supreme Court and what cases are happening and how are our day-to-day -day lives actually practically affected by it and it was just a lot of fun. Our professor, she's on a lot of the news channels and she has her own podcast. So it's kind of exciting to just get a glimpse into that world a little bit. And she brought in a some judges that we would be able to ask. We asked some questions to them and got to learn a little bit about it. And it was just really immersive and positive and hands-on. And I enjoyed it a lot. Cool. Uh, Mary, I was actually going to ask, this is more of a... Um... I'm just going to ask you the questions that I'm interested in <laughs> um, for bar, like, how do you feel? Let me just try to figure out how to word this question for bar prep. What courses? Cause I think, I believe we have a bar track that students are able to take where basically the registrar just breaks down what classes you should be taking for the bar. Um, but you don't have to take those classes. So I assume people are studying for the bar and then studying for those things that maybe they didn't take a class in. Anyway, I don't know what my question is, but if you could just speak more to how you fit in the bar prep courses to maybe 
you know, if you were doing a concentration and something like totally different. No, I, I get what you're saying. Um, so one L every, pretty much everything you take is go every substantive course that, that you take is a bar course. So there's subjects like property contracts, um, civil procedure, criminal law. Those are all things that are fair game for the California bar exam, at least. And um, so those are all things that you are just mandated to take. And then after that, during 2L, there are additional courses that Loyola, which is kind of something unique to Loyola, requires you to take, which is like constitutional law, um, ethical lawyering, and evidence. Um, but after you take those requirements, you, it's kind of up to you how much time you want to spend on taking additional bar course subjects. But um, I found that there's a lot of ways that you can fill up your units. And after 1L, the classes like change in, in terms of their unit amount. So 1L, typically your classes are going to be like four or five units, but 2L and 3L classes can be two units or three units or four units. So there's a lot of different ways to fill up your schedule. I took the approach of taking as many bar courses as possible throughout 2L and 3L, um, just because I think I'm going to feel more comfortable when I sit down before studying for the bar and I'm not having to see something fresh for the first time, but it's something that I've already been exposed to. But I mean, besides that, I've been able to take skills-based classes, and um, also Loyola has certain classes that are literally like just geared for the bar exam, like um, a pass fail class for the multiple choice portion of the bar exam. And that's not something that I've heard about at other schools, at least personally. And then there was a class that was focused on bar writing skills. Um, and so those are things that you can consider taking during your thrill if you kind of want to like dip your toes in a very low stakes environment um, before actually like diving into hardcore bar prep, which takes place the summer after you graduate law school. So once you've completed three, uh, if you're a day student, once you've completed your third year. Nice. Thank you. And then speaking of that, or is anyone, Kari, I don't think you would decide yet, but are you going to take a concentration or are you taking electives? Do you take electives your spring of your second year? So have you decided on the concentration? Or are you not doing a concentration? I I considered the tax concentration, but I was like, I don't know that I have enough time for that. <laughs> yeah. So I, it sounded really cool though, because I could get the certification at the same time and it's only like 12 additional credits, which seems mm -hmm. very achievable. But just, I'm thinking like, no, I think I'm gonna balance my time with, internships and other things mm -hmm. like that. So, mm -hmm. um, so for me, um, I will probably stick with the course and they open up the additional and oh, additional classes, I think when we get into year three. So it's mm -hmm. a four-year program and I'm a currently a 2E. So I believe next year is when I start to get more opportunities. But I do know some of my classmates are already taking tax courses and then I'm a writing specialist. So I'm taking a course for that presently. So I'm already starting to take some classes that I want. You just need to make sure that you balance it with, I think there's a maximum of, I think it's 11 units and you can maybe extend it a little bit beyond it per semester for the evening program. So you can be able to put some of the classes in there, but I think it's mostly year three, which is when you get that flexibility. Mm -hmm. And I want to probably take some property courses and then also like disability advocacy and things like that. So I look forward to taking advantage of all the courses that are available. <laughs> Very cool. Lauren, do you know if you want to concentrate in something? Mm, I'm thinking about tax, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking a tax elective right now and I'm considering um, applying for the JD Tax LM program. Okay. Very cool. Any questions? Did I miss anything? Someone asked about submitting a CV or a resume. Um, and I don't want to misspeak, but in my brain, those are relatively the same. Um, and I would have to look up what the real difference is, but I have seen both. 
and I don't know if they're just structured differently. Um, okay, but... yeah, I sorry, I asked that question because um, my background's in research, so I've just used CV, so I was wondering if that's still acceptable. Yes, I would think so. Okay. I mean, I would need to really look up what the biggest differences are, um, but if it's just the way that it's structured, then then I, I, I've seen them before. So it must, I would assume it's fine. Um, and like I was saying in my presentation, your resume can be a little different than, um, maybe what you would do for a job application. Um, it can be a little more detailed, um, and you can put, I wouldn't go crazy on the hobbies or anything, but if it's something super interesting and unique, I wouldn't be afraid to put it down. Um, um, so, so yeah, so I'm sure a CV is fine too. And if that involves like a lot of research, like you've done, a, maybe you've published papers or something, then that is, um, only positive. Any other questions? Um, yes, Sophia. Um, just out of curiosity, what uh, organi like student orgs are you guys involved in and how do they benefit your uh, law school journey? They don't want to kick it off. I can start. Um, last year as a 2L, I was in the Day Students Bar Association, which is kind of like um, student gov not student gov okay, like SBA kind of like. Um, and I was the external social chair. So I organized a lot of um, off-campus social events. And I thought that enhanced my law school experience because I got to meet a lot of people through it. And it's really nice being able to see your classmates like outside of the law school setting. And uh, besides that, I also involved in the Armenian Law Students Association. And that was important for me to have like an Armenian community at school because it's just people that you can connect with at a cultural level. Um, and there's a lot of community there and you meet people across all grades too. So that's a good way to meet people that are not necessarily in your section or in your grade. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, groups and clubs like that, that you can join. And I'm pretty sure there's probably a list somewhere that has all of the, um, affinity groups at the school yeah for me I try to participate in the events that are put on by the public interest law foundation so because I'm interested in public interest and disability advocacy and trying to help people in that area for me that's an area that's of interest to me I also like the women in law I try to stay apprised of that one. I think it's just awesome to hear the stories of females in the industry who have done an amazing job and who are opening their experiences and taking the opportunity to answer questions. So I really like those two. And then there's also one for like health law that I try to go to occasionally. And there's also one for owls, which is older, wiser students, I think, something like that. <laughs> uh, so th those are the ones that I have really gravitated towards and enjoy, but there's a lot of different organizations that are a good place for you to find a place where you can fit in and also to expand your, your network and friends and interests. For me, I joined the First Generation Law School Association and the Women's Law Association. And I really liked how they put on panels and they serve you lunch. And they also give you the opportunity to be assigned a mentor. And that mentor could help you with like your classes or give you an outline for a class that they've already took. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for she dropped the link for student orgs. So feel free to check those out. Um. Another question for ambassadors, do you or are you involved or planning on being involved with any clinics? Mary, you being a 3L day, you probably. Yeah, uh, during my 2L, 2L year, I was in the pro se mediation advocacy clinic. 
Um, and so this clinic is focused on employment and housing discrimination um, and re helping represent pro se plaintiffs um, in mediations. So mediations are basically like out of court um, informal negotiations that can take place between parties where you're basically just trying to talk to one another and see if you can come up with a solution before pursuing a case in court. And so we would help uh, people who were terminated from their job, for example, and they believe that it was on the basis of race or a disability and things like that. And we would actually re represent them in the mediation against um, actual attorneys opposing counsel from big corporations and things like that. And so it was really great hands-on experience. Um, so it was like a little bit daunting at first, but you work in a group of other students. So you have a team and there's always someone there to chime in if you yourself are having a bit of trouble, but uh, our professor was also there to advise us throughout the entire thing. But it, it was like the first time that I felt like I was truly kind of like being a baby attorney, basically. <laughs> Kari, have you, you probably have not yet, but are you hoping to do, oh yeah, you said, but you're, anyway, yes. Feel free to yeah, go. I, I have not yet. Um, there's a, like a children's advocacy clinic that we have here. So that's something that I've been keeping an eye on and might do. It doesn't necessarily align 100% with where I'd like to go, but to be able to advocate for kids is kind of in a some, similar realm. So that's something I'm considering, uh, but the internships as well. And one of the internships I'm currently looking at and have lined up is to actually do like what I want to be practicing. So I might, I'm, I'm looking at all options, but that's one of the ones that I'm looking at at the moment. Okay, cool. Um, I'm trying to think of questions that a lot of students ask in these of our ambassadors. I think the common question is like the competitiveness of law school. I think that's usually a fear of for students coming in, um, the curve, all the same the they hear horror stories that it's so that people are very mean and if anyone can speak to maybe alleviate those concerns i will say i guess that law school again correct me if i'm wrong ambassadors but i think it is inherently competitive because of the curve but it's not in the way where people are stepping like trying to purposefully make other students do bad yeah uh, i can jump in um i don't know sometimes you hear really dramatic stories of people like hiding books in the library so other people can't access them i don't i've never encountered anything like that here and i don't think anyone is ever doing anything to maliciously confuse you. Like if you ask your C partner in class, like, hey, I just missed what the professor said. Could you, could I see the note you jotted down? I don't think anyone is going to like move their paper and say no to you. Um, so I think overall people are very nice, uh, but every law school I think is graded on a curve. That's just something that you get used to. And sometimes that's not a bad thing. Like when you look at the raw scores on tests, sometimes you're like, oh, I'm actually very glad that this was curved. <laughs> <laughs> and you just have to think about the fact that everybody is kind of on the same playing field and it's it's going to pan out the same way for everybody based on the curve. Um, and also you might have heard of things called outlines, which are what people use to study for exams. And at this school, there is something called the St. Thomas More Outline Bank, which is um, open to all students. So everyone has equal access to it. And it basically has outlines from prior students who took these classes and got um, A minuses and above in those classes. So that is open to everybody. There's not any situation of people hoarding outlines or I don't know. That's just kind of something that you hear a lot in um, TV shows about law school. Like, oh, I have this outline and you don't. But here there's just like a bank of very good outlines accessible to everyone. So it's kind of up to you what you make of the resources that are available to you.
any other thoughts or we can move on to my other juicy questions everyone i've met so far has been really nice <laughs> <laughs> i agree I mean, most one of my peers been... that told me about the outline bank too it's not like they're trying to hide it or anything good I, I will add to that it is competitive, but I think in like a good way, like where you're kind of like all cheering each other on, like, I want to get, I want to do really well. I want to do really well. And then if someone does better than you, you're kind of like, oh, but at the same time, you're like, yay, friend. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think a lot of the people in law school and a lot of the people here are very talented and very smart and I think driven to do amazing things. So I think that there is a at least a little bit of competitiveness with it but it's it's not sabotaging it's not bringing people down it's celebrating each other when they have their moments and bringing each other up so i i i like that because i like that i want to do better because my classmates are so impressive too so mm -hmm. it encourages me to stretch myself that's a good point um okay next anyone that Check in. Anyone have any questions for me and admissions or our ambassadors? Also, if any of the ambassadors, I think Kelly mentioned, if any of you need to drop off for a class or anything, um, feel free to do that. Um, I think another concern that we hear from students who are coming into law school is um, kind of similar, but another thing that they stress about is the workload and how to prioritize any other component of their life that is not academia. Um, and if you guys, I think 1L, well, I'm, I think each year is so different. Um, but if you guys could speak to how that looked for you, what you, if you've learned anything on how to stay organized, how to continue to take care of yourself through law school. I can go first. Um, well, I think uh, 1L is definitely difficult across the board wherever you go, just because there is a lot of adjustments that need to be made in terms of how you're studying, because law school just really isn't like classes in college. So, um, the sooner you're able to kind of pick up what works best for you, um, the easier it'll get. And it is a learning curve. So it's, you just have to just kind of be patient with yourself. Um, but after first semester, you get your grades back, you'll kind of figure out like, oh, this is what worked for me. And this is what didn't. And this is how I'm going to proceed. Uh, but one big thing is kind of not getting burnt out as you go. Um, because, Typically in a class, your grade will be composed of a final, like pretty much your final exam determines your grade. So if the whole semester you're just like not sleeping well, um, not eating well, just tiring yourself out, by the time that you get to final exam season, you're going to be like a shell of a human and you're not going to be performing well on your exam. And I always like recommend to people like don't bring yourself out because you really have to like save up that endurance for right before finals because that's kind of when it matters the most in terms of a great outcome. And of course you want to be learning along the way, but not to the detriment of your health and your um, mental wellness. But um, there are certain things that people will be happy to advise you about. There's things like um, reading supplements that kind of dense down what your reading said, because during 1L you're reading cases and sometimes you're like, okay, what the heck is this saying? I don't know what it's saying. There are resources where you can go and type in the case name and it'll say, here's what the issue was in this case. Here's what the holding was. Here's a summary of the facts. Sometimes there's a nice little video. So those types of things help you condense the material in a way that's like digestible and that allows you to move on to other things because there's a lot of balancing that goes on, especially during 1L. But um, it does get easier and you kind of figure out your method to achieve success. Also, I want to add that um, there is a lot of room for improvement. Like there's people who 
don't do that well during first semester and then they absolutely excel afterwards. Or there's people that do really well and then they get very confident and then their grades go down. So it's just a matter of confidence and knowing where you stand and like continuing to do the things that are beneficial to you. Sorry, or Lauren. All right, I'll go. So I'm old school. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I went back to school after a long time of working um, in property management and hotel management. So for me, old school. Uh, so I take my notes by hand and then I have binders. I actually have them here. <laughs> uh, so I have binders where I just keep track. I print out the syllabus and I just keep track of each week. Okay, did I go through each of them? And then I just get in a habit of checking each of them to make sure that I've gone through everything. And then I handwrite my notes and the outlining, um, just like Mary was talking about with the, and then I think Lauren was talking about the St. Thomas More. Uh, but there's the outlines are a great way to get an understanding of where you're headed in the class and a bit of a roadmap, high level. So those are great resources. And then there's also Quimby and there's lots of online Barbary. There's lots of online resources where you can also, like Mary was talking about, you can get familiar with the the formatting of how the opinions are written, what is in the content, things like that. So there's a lot of tools that are available to students. I know a lot of my classmates use OneNote, but there's, so there's a lot of different ways, but I usually start with my syllabus and then that's usually how I organize my week to week. And then I usually start studying for tests about a month before the actual test of trying to actually get to the memorization part and doing practice tests. But I might do them sooner if the teacher encourages it or provides it. And the at least for us in the first year that we had, we had a lot of handholding. So here are some example tests, practice on these. And here's like when you might want to be studying for things. There was a lot of establishing good habits. So I think that the teachers here definitely work with us to create good habits and strategies so that way we can do well in the new formatting. I'd echo that. I think that planning ahead is really helpful for me and don't procrastinate because everything like builds on top of other material. So if you like lose track, it's hard to catch up. But I really like the fact that all lectures are recorded for the most part and you can always go back and review it if you're confused. But, like if you want to just take a day off, you could just rewatch the recording and I'll be fine. <laughs> nice okay check in again any questions no question is a dumb question yes Sophia you are the MVP of this event <laughs> <laughs> thank you I just I just just have so many questions that are kind of like popping up mm -hmm. um, but especially for studying for the LSAT, again, I know everyone studies differently and some people like have like these courses or some others kind of like take the Khan Academy, which is going to get discontinued. I'm so sad about that. But anyway, I just wanted to like ask you what worked for you personally to study for the LSAT and what are some things that maybe you don't hear too often that can benefit you for the LSAT? Anyone can jump in. Everyone hated okay, the LSAT. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I did use a program. I used PowerScore. I think it was good. I, I not, I'm not a fan of testing very much. So, um, but I would say what I gleaned from it is just really the strategy of it, of make sure that you don't just stop and get, I get anxious as well. So just make sure that you don't stop and you just keep going was I think probably one of the biggest things for me to learn, which has been really good for me in law school as well, because if you get stuck on a question and it just, you're just sideswiped by it, you, you can't stop, you have to keep going. So I think a big part for me was mentally kind of preparing myself of this is a test, you just keep going. And then I think for me, reading the call of the question and knowing when to read the call of the question versus reading the fact pattern, 
for me, that's something that's been really good for strategy as well, because sometimes you'll have a short question and maybe it makes sense to be reading all the facts first and then the call. But oftentimes, like if you have a huge fact pattern and you have a small call, the question that's helpful to read the call, the question first, so you know what you're looking for above. So I'd, I would say that going, creating your own strategies of what you think works for you, both mentally and also strategically is the way that I approached going through the standardized testing and that I continue to work on and be mindful. Like how many minutes should I go through on a question and doing lots of practices, lots of practice questions. That's one of the best ways to really learn what you're getting wrong and to get better at it is to just try it and then go, oh, well, why did I get it wrong? And then ask yourself, why did I fall into this trap? Was this maybe too absolute? Did this answer include all the time? Well, that's a very high bar of proof to do all the time. So the more that you do the questions, the more you also get familiar with traps where you can kind of identify, okay, well, it, that's a really high bar. It could be met, but it's got to be a really convincing answer if I'm going to choose this one. So I would say lots of practice would be a good idea. And there's some really good books that I actually really enjoyed the books a lot too, where I would just go through and do practice questions. And that got me familiarized with them. And there's, there's only so many different types of patterns. So once you get familiar with them, things become easier. I like doing entire practice tests like every week and then seeing the improvement was also motivating too. And I used the LSAT trainer by Mike Kim. I thought that was really helpful to break down the concepts and learn the material bit by bit and then just read like a chapter a day or two and then slowly build on from there. And once you see improvement, you'll become more motivated to continue and finish and take the test. And you also get like try like two tries. Most people take two tries. And you can also cancel your first score if you decide you don't want, like it or anything like that. You have a lot of time to like do the test. It's completely doable. <laughs> uh, I took it probably like four or five years ago at this point, but um, I think Seven Sage is a good program. Um. And then another thing that I've heard about, and people say this for like bar exam studying too, is to keep a journal of like your, it's one thing to take practice exams, but the most important part is like learning from your mistakes. So I've heard of people keeping like uh, journals of their wrong answers and like fully writing out, this was my reasoning for getting this answer and this is why it's wrong. And, and this is why the correct answer is correct. And so doing that and like really like soaking in where you went wrong and kind of shifting away from that, I think is a good strategy because um, you can take practice exams galore, but if you're just repeat making the same mistakes, like then there's not going to be any improvements in terms of numbers. I will say one thing um, from an admissions side for the LSAT, just, I don't think I said this in my presentation, but yes, you can take it multiple times, but the admissions committee will start to want context if you take it like three or more times. Um, and then if you score like three or more points, um, negative or positive, um, and you know, because yes, theoretically, you should be getting better every time you take the test. So if you take it, I think they max it out now. You can only take it five times um, within a certain amount of time. I can't remember what it is. But anyway, hopefully you're not taking it five times. Um, but if you were, you should, of course, naturally get better at it. So that isn't as impressive to the admissions committee. It's, it's better if you can get a score that you feel good about within that first or second try. Um, and then you would include an addendum if you decide to take it more than that, say there was a proctor issue or, um, you know, some other reason that you feel like your score doesn't represent your actual abilities, that's when you can include an addendum to your file. Thank you so much. That actually helps so much. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for asking questions. Any other questions? 
Um, I should have been thinking of questions this whole time. Kari, what is... I'm trying to think of questions that a lot of students typically ask. Um, I feel like we've really covered it all. Does anyone else have any questions? Because we could just wrap this up early. Um, if no one else has any further questions. Because I think we did, we really nailed it, I think. Sophia, I see you thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Since we like since you kind of like want us to ask questions, I'll just Yeah, please. Have one more. Um sure. So I right now I'm in an undergraduate program to get a paralegal certification. And since we're doing kind of like all these um what do you call them? Like all these like programs, like when you're in law school, I was wondering like if you have a paralegal certification to come in with, could could that be used for like any certain specific program when you're there or so uh Application wise, it could be, you know, a positive that you have some um, legal understanding that you've done some work. Um, so application wise, I think it's it can be helpful. It's, of course, not a requirement um, uh, that just jogged. Another thing a lot of students wonder about is whether or not they have to be taking a certain doing a certain major doing any certain legal internships while they're in college and those aren't necessary um we like to admit students who come from hard sciences who come from the arts who come from all sorts of things so um so anyway, back to your question um that would only help your application as i don't think there's anything that you would necessarily use it for at least from what i know while you're here um but I'm sure it would be useful because you, you're you gaining some legal knowledge. Just to add to that, I do think it would be helpful when going through your law courses, because if you already have some experience with it, you'll be going into the classes already with some familiarity of some of the terms and formatting and things like that. So I think it would be beneficial. Any other questions? I'm going to drop my email in the chat. So if anyone has um, any follow-up questions, feel free to email me. Um, happy to answer any questions. And then thank you to our ambassadors who have super busy schedules as we have all learned. Um, and thank you for answering all of my silly questions. And again, if anyone has questions, just email me, but thank you for joining. Um, we also do a lot of events in the fall for prospective students. So if you're not quite to the point where you're applying now, the fall, we have application workshops, um, an open house that is specific to the law school. Um, we provide campus tours pretty much all year. So come on down um, to downtown and we'll show you around. Um, and then hopefully we see you in the fall. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.